So I'm Greg Grothaus, uh, Gregable on GitHub. You may have seen me around. I'm TL of the AMP team that works on the AMP validator, as well as several things within the AMP cache. Um, today we're going to be talking about a particular effort that the, we're working on for the AMP cache called packaging. So while it may have slipped your attention, AMP pages on an AMP cache have a bit of an identity problem. Uh, the AMP cache delivers fantastic performance for AMP pages for all of our customers, but to do so, it has to deliver the document using the AMP cache's own identity, uh, not the original author's intended identity, in this case, google.com. So while AMP pages are linked from AMP search, uh, they use a viewer in order to achieve what we call privacy-preserving pre-rendering and delivery via the AMP cache. Um, the downside of this is the displayed URL uh, in this document is Google instead of New York Times. Um, but let's talk a little bit more. I, I think uh, Malta mentioned this, and a few other talk, uh, speakers mentioned this earlier this morning. But let's talk a little bit more about privacy pr preserving pre rendering. Uh, tongue twister. How does it work, and what does it do? Um, so before we, we talk about privacy preserving pre rendering, uh, we need to understand why, what's, what's going on with the AMP's URL model. Uh, in particular, the, and why we actually care about this. So the, in particular, AMP cache URLs complicate a lot of different things. Um, there's the URL itself, people don't like that, but that in turn in the browser causes all sorts of problems. So cookies are based on domains, um, cores, service workers, et cetera. And the list goes on. Um, cookies are a particularly interesting one because they break all sorts of analytics uh, and analytic sessions where you want to know what a user's, how to interact, a user interacts with your website as they move from the AMP cache to your domain uh, and throughout your domain. So why do we put up with this? And how does it create the URL situation? So pre-rendering means the page can be ready to display before a user even clicks on a link. So imagine I search for this query AMP project. Result page looks something like this. What happens is in the background on my browser, the search page instructs my browser to go ahead and pre-render this, this result here, um, imagining that may, maybe I'm going to click on it. So let's see what happens when I click. So I don't know if you saw that, it was really quick. But basically, in what I perceived as an instantaneous amount of time, I now have the document to read in my browser. This works in part because the document I clicked was already loaded um, before I even clicked on it. So part of the trick here is that some of the sub-resources, like images and videos, haven't actually loaded yet. They'll load shortly after. Those heavy resources only load once I click the document. This both saves bandwidth if I didn't actually want to click on the document. Let's say I clicked something else. But it also protects my privacy. That's the privacy part of the privacy-preserving pre-rendering. How does that work? So what we really don't want is that before I click on a link, third-party resources start loading. Because the reason is, as Malta talked about with the diarrhea query earlier this morning, is those third-party resources may leak information about my query that I didn't intend. <laughs> yep. So <laughs> uh, so that includes things like this, this image. Uh, it also includes analytics. Um, even something like a video may be a third-party resource that now that gets logged. Um, this is kind of an, a, a very simplified explanation of privacy prefers preserving pre-rendering. We want to pre-render these pages for quick access. But in order to preserve privacy, the, we have no choice but to load all of the resources from Google's AMP cache. This provides a buffer between the user and the publisher until the user clicks the result. And this set of constraints leads us to the URL problem I mentioned at the very beginning. The question we have is, can we achieve privacy-preserving pre-rendering while fixing the identity problem at the same time? That's sort of like eating, eating your cake and having it too, or having your cake and eating it too, however you say it. So before I jump into that, let me recap a little bit how the web, parts of the web, at least, sort of work today. This is a very rough diagram uh, of kind of internet connections. There's a lot more going on here. Uh, there's peering, there's interconnects, carrier pigeons, et cetera. Uh, PLS, which many of you know is HTTPS, um, 
is what provides both identity and privacy on the web to connections to, to a final server. This system, which is built a long time ago, requires a real-time connection between a user all the way back to some server in this network that possesses private keys for a domain name. Um, the area covered by this section is fairly arbitrary. Um, why some servers and not all of them? Um, in particular, the AMP cache can't provide that real-time connection. The reason is it doesn't possess the private keys for that domain, except for, of course, google.com, ampproject.org, et cetera. So, so there's something we're building uh, along with the ITF. It's a new set of browser technologies. It's under the umbrella term called web packaging. And the specific one we're interested in uh, is signed exchanges. All of these things help us build privacy-preserving prefetches while displaying uh, the URL correctly of the document to a user. Signed exchanges, in particular, provide digital proof in the form of a digital signature that a document delivered by an AMP cache uh, has not been modified from what the publisher originally desired or intended. So what happens is when a browser sees one of these things, it can display the publisher's URL regardless of who delivered that file in the last hop. Sealed for your protection. So much like a tamper-proof bottle. So signed exchanges open up a bunch of use cases. And this is not only in AMP, but throughout the web in general. Uh, and Chrome is looking at, and the ITF is looking at various ways of, of, of using this uh, particular technology, including things like web publications, peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and integrity-preserving distribution of content on the web. But for AMP, the interesting case we want to solve is to separate the URL authority from the delivery mechanism of the document, which will allow the AMP cache to deliver a document untampered on behalf of a third party, uh, which has authorized the AMP cache to do so. Uh, we demonstrated an early preview of this at I.O. earlier this year, uh, and we're hoping to make it more widely available soon. Let's see what it looks like. Excuse me. This simplified doc diagram shows an AMP document in a signed exchange moving through the AMP cache. Um, the AMP cache can deliver the signed exchange to a user's browser rather than the publisher, thus preserving privacy during the preload event, which is one of our requirements. Let's zoom, zoom in on the right-hand side for a second. OK, so in order for the browser to accept the signed exchange and do what we want and show the publisher's URL, must not be modified in transit. So the AMP cache can deliver the document, but the signature must be remain intact byte for byte. This has an important consequence for all of you. Um, the AMP cache can no longer apply optimizations to the document itself, as that would be tampering and break the digital signature. Um, so unfortunately, while Chrome will soon understand signed exchanges, web servers, as a result of this, will need to change in order to be able to serve these things. So let's zoom in on that side and see what it looks like. All right, so the AMP cache cannot apply these optimizations that it does today, but we still want them. Those optimizations make the pages load faster, they help with security, and so forth. So what we're going to do is have publishers produce those optimizations on their side before signing the documents. We're building a web server called the AMP Packager uh, and you can see this right now in GitHub, also underneath the AMP project, uh, which anyone can run, which will apply AMP cache optimizations and serve signed exchanges on your own URL. Even still, as you can imagine, running this extra infrastructure, or extra software on your infrastructure, is clearly hard for many publishers to do. This leads us to the second part of this talk. So next, I'd like to introduce Avery Harnish. Uh, Avery is currently attending Lafayette College, where he's completing a double major in computer science and religious studies. He recently uh, completed an internship as a systems engineer at Cloudflare, where he worked on developing applications for Cloudflare's Edge Worker product. Uh, continuing on as an independent contractor, one of the applications he's building for Cloudflare is the first CDN implementation of a signed exchange generator. So Avery here is, is here today to tell us about his work. Okay. 
Thanks, Greg. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Cloudflare is an internet performance and security company. Uh, we serve around 10% of internet requests through our network and regularly mitigate uh, large DDoS attacks for our customers. Our customers are, are, are webmasters, so if you own a website, um, you can sign up to use Cloudflare service. Uh, last year, we released Cloudflare Workers, and we're developing a worker that will do everything that you need to do for signing exchanges uh, with nothing required other than signing up for a service. So if you remember this slide from just a little bit ago, um, you can see that you have to set up the AMP Packager. You've got to set up, set up a front-end reverse proxy. Um, this, is, this is a solution for publishers. You can definitely follow this route, um, but it requires a, a lot of setup, and you have to um, get a special certificate. Um, and generally, there's, it's just complicated. Um, so the publisher has to handle everything on their side, um, but Cloudflare is working on a, a, a way that will make it so that um, publishers really don't have to do any work at all in order to serve signed exchanges. Um, so our goal is to take the, away the configuration burden um, from publishers and make it simple. Just sign up for Cloudflare, and you can start serving signed exchanges right away. Be on your merry way. Don't give it a second thought. Um, but how does that work? Uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about um, how Cloudflare works, um, give a little bit more background on that. Uh, so when you sign up for Cloudflare, um, you use our DNS name servers. Um, and basically what, what that means is that instead of um, like example.com pointing to um, the IP address of your AWS server, it now points to um, Cloudflare's IP address. And we use, uh, we use something called Anycast, which basically um, means that one IP address can point to um, any number of our data centers. So we have over 150 data centers um, spread across the world, and we're, we're um, constantly expanding that number. Um, uh, basically, once a request comes in for your site, it'll go to the nearest Cloudflare server, um, and then a bunch of stuff happens. So um, DNS query resolves to our IP address. The request um, finds the Cloudflare ser server nearest them. From here, we detect and mitigate DDoS attacks, make sure the request isn't known to be malicious. Um, if the request is valid, it'll continue on to our cache. Uh, and it'll retrieve static content such as HTML if someone in that area had recently um, requested that same static content. Then the request goes to your server to get what isn't in the cache, do some business logic, whatever um, whatever we can't do, and only you guys know about. Um, it goes and it does it does that, and then it comes back. We do a couple little bit uh, a, cu a couple more performance enhancements and um, aggregate insights for you. And then there's workers. Uh, so workers are new. Um, they handle incoming requests with logic written by you, the webmaster. They allow you to do anything you can do with JavaScript as long as you return a standard response object. So this example Cloudflare worker is pretty simple. It just uh, listens for fetch events and passes the event to the handle request function here. Uh, it logs the request object, passes the request object to a new fetch call, and then it, it just logs the response variable and returns the response. So it really doesn't do anything, but you can see that you have access to the request and the response. Um, here's a little bit more of an in-depth example. Um, what it does is it's going out and it's fetching um, three um, cryptocurrency prices from Coinbase, and then it just returns it in like a standard API. So this is this is you could run this without um, owning any infrastructure. You could do it without any. Um, like cloud subscription or anything, um, and a request to your website would come in, and then it would return these three um, uh, prices in a JSON format in a, in a standardized response. Uh, so what makes Cloudflare special, uh, this, this may remind you a little bit of like AWS, uh, like Lambda or Lambda at Edge, but what makes it special is that it's super, super fast. Um, so the custom JavaScript that executes on our servers um, are actually in V8 isolates. So you don't have access to things like um, the node runtime, um, but what we, what we um, sacrifice in um, like node runtime capability, we can get um, really, really good performance. Um, so this, this is the, the orange bar there on the bottom is um, workers, and then we have Lambda at Edge and Lambda. Um, workers is 441% faster than a Lambda function at the 95th percentile. Uh, since Cloudflare workers only support a single script, it might seem like developing a large project to generate sign exchanges, interact with crypto, uh, cryptography um, 
uh, ideas and, and things is infeasible. Um, but with things like NPM or Yarn um, and Webpack, uh, we can develop large project, projects that compile to a single script, and it can respond to multiple different kinds of requests. So the worker that we've developed to tackle sign exchanges is written in modern ES6 JavaScript. Um, it uses the Web Crypto API for signing payloads and is able to dynamically serve signed exchanges for AMP publishers with no backend configuration. So let's get into it. There's two things we have to accomplish before we can serve, um, before browsers can accept that the AMP document is originally from the publisher. First, we have to encode the data in a way that can't be modified, and we also have to sign this encoded data using a private key. Let's dive into what that means. First, let's talk about Merkle trees. Merkle trees are used by blockchain technologies like Bitcoin and Ethereum because they can be used to validate large amounts of data. Uh, the root up there at the top is a hash or fingerprint of the entire set of data. If we started traversing up the tree from a leaf node, we can verify that the hashes match the parent and that the leaf is part of the original fingerprint. Basically, if someone said that they had a little bit of data, Merkle trees can um, verify the validity of said data. For our encoding use case, um, we can apply Merkle trees in a slightly different way than what's, used, um, what's usually used. Uh, instead of a fully balanced tree, we can use a right skewed tree that allows us to verify that the data hasn't been modified. So what does that look like? Here's an example of what the encoding uh, would look like. Typically, a signed exchange would um, encode an HTML page, but for the purpose of demonstration, we'll just use the string, when I grow up, I want to be a watermelon. Record size here is just 16. It simply denotes um, where to insert hashes. Typically, this will be a number larger. I think it's uh, the standard is like 4096. Um, the first eight bytes are encoded. Uh, they're just padded with zeros, and then it's, it ends with the record size. And then um, it interchanges between um, message and then um, the hash, and then message, and then hash, and then message. And basically, you can't change any of this um, without completely invalidating um, the encoding. So you can decode this, and you can say you can you can basically check to see that it hasn't been tampered with. So that's how we encode the data, um, but we still need to authorize intermediaries like Google's AMP cache to serve this encoded content, and we need to make sure that they're not just making an HTML um, page, encoding it in the same way and just serving it without actually having um, the publisher validate um, that, that, that it's coming from them. Um, so like Greg said earlier, this is typically done with a TLS, a continuous TLS connection, um, but since the content isn't being served from the publisher and it's being served by Google's AMP cache, um, it's just, it just won't do. So the solution is a new certificate extension. Um, it's just for signing HTTP exchanges. Um, publishers have to use the ECDSA private key with their new certificate to sign their encoded content before handing it off to Google's AMP cache to serve. Uh, and they also have to host the public certificate on, or yeah, the, they have to host the public certificate on the web for browsers to verify um, that the sign exchange has been signed by the publisher. So there are other details um, that need to be implemented um, with signed exchanges, but we've covered the crux of the problem. The main, the main point is that it needs to be um, tamper-proof, and the publisher needs to be able to um, sign uh, and, and prove that they um, have provided this content to Google's AMP cache. That's just about it. Um, Cloudflare's implementation is being developed in parallel um, with Google's updates to the protocol um, and alongside Google's AMP Packager. Um, we're committed to providing a fix to AMP URL problem for publishers. Um, we aren't ready to announce open support for this protocol yet as it's still in a very experimental stage, um, but keep your eyes peeled for sign exchanges support in the future. Thanks for your time. If you have questions, I'll be around today and tomorrow. Uh, let me know if there's anything that I missed. Thank you. Thank you.